Wolfgang, it's very good to speak to you. Last time we met was in Davos and the times were much, much better than today. So what do you make of this situation? What's really going on? Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to see you again and, uh, and uh, running straight into this question. <laughs> I, I believe that um, currently, uh, Big is exactly what is going on. Uh, there are two, two schools, in fact, the people who believe it is um, very severe and the people who think that there is probably a little bit of dramatization in, in it. Um, possibly, as, as often in life, uh, truth lies, uh, reality lies between both. Uh, it is definitely a human tragedy, and uh, we have seen that before. Um, I also say, uh, luckily, it's not Ebola, because there are uh, two out of three die, uh, but it is also not a flu. So yeah. that's, that's the, the, the basis, base situation. Economically, um, governments have decided uh, several governments have decided to shut down the economy to a large extent, which uh, has um, severe consequences. And the question here is, how long will that closure take? And uh, then what I'm thinking most about is, how do we reboot because pulling the plug is easy. Restarting the engine is much, much harder. I looked at so much data in the last three weeks because this has been kind of quite a shock to me in a sense of, I don't know, like all my business studies and everything have not really prepared me for this. And so many businesses I know of that have already gone bust, that have shut down that have had to majorly reorganize what they do and so on. And many, many, many businesses have been affected by the supply chain uh, disruption that seems to have become, as you said, you know, it's easy to unplug, but how that's going to come back, um, God only knows, it seems like. Uh, but so what, what is... How, how is that reboot going to happen? Because so many businesses are like now, how do we get back to some sort of normality? And it looks like normality won't really come back as it was before. What, what are you predicting? I believe one has to distinguish between uh, relatively simple and, and local supply chains. Um, for example, the whole agriculture, retail, restaurant, uh, supply chain, and much more complex global supply chains uh, in automotive, in electronics. When it is about local supply chains, uh, they are already functioning. So people don't go to a restaurant, they buy the food in the grocery uh, shop in the supermarket. So that's a rerouting and the truck just goes somewhere else. And uh, that's relatively easy. So there will be also in future toilet paper and salad and uh, <laughs> the necessary things we need uh, every day. With uh, the more complex supply chains, it uh, I think depends on individual organizations. It depends how they have set up their global supply network. Those who fly parts back and forth will have some difficulties because we are not sure how the aviation industry will reboot, where the containers will be, etc. So a lot of uncertainties uh, to um, too, I think, severe to just say, uh, we start shipping again. It's about synchronizing uh, 
global processes. So it's a, it's a very, very funny thing that you say, you know, the, the toilet paper will continue coming and your local restaurant will continue operating because one thing that we've already experienced here is that both myself and my wife are originally from Bosnia and we buy this um, flour that, that we really like from Bosnia, from like a local Turkish uh, shop. And then I was, because I've been watching what's happening in each country around the world, I was watching the Bosnia news and they were showing the, 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 the video footage from the factory that produces that flour that we really like. And they said, we've run out, that's it. We cannot produce anymore. And potentially now people are under pressure to not grow wheat this year. So, so next year's flour, God only knows if, if they're going to produce it. So we've, we've already run out of the favorite flour that, that, that we like, and we're having to go to a different type of flour that's a lot more locally produced. So do you see, and in case of, for example, Bosnia as a country, even though it's capable of producing a lot of local food, it, for whatever reason, still imports like 95% plus of its food produce. Do you see countries moving towards a lot more locally uh, food producing, a lot more locally uh, depend, dependence kind of on supplies and production? I believe that um, some will try this. Um, however, the, the, there are reasons why supply chains are what they are. Independence from energy, from food supply, is in the interest of every country and has been pushed uh, over, over hundreds of years, in fact. Uh, it's at the root cause of geopolitics. And um, there is a limitation to uh, independency. Some larger countries can achieve higher levels, provided they have the preconditions, but especially smaller countries have uh, their, their challenge. And there are also the, the climate, climate, there is the climate. Um, if you want to grow food, you need the, the climate to do so. So yes, as I said, some will try, but uh, um, at the end, not that much change in this area will happen. So another thing that, that's become very uh, popular uh, in, in terms of people discussing it is that a, a similar exercise to this sort of coronavirus outbreak uh, was run in World Economic Forum uh, kind of design thinking exercise in, in November last year. And, and it was almost exactly same kind of scenario. Uh, and it, it looks like, you know, various kind of preparations have been done in the past for these kind of scenarios. Uh, to, to what extent do you think the world has been prepared for this versus to what extent do various preparations need to still go on? Uh, and, and how does that actually even work? <laughs> yeah, humans learn from experience. And uh, the best prepared countries were those that had suffered from similar crises, uh, from the SARS crisis, Hong Kong, Singapore. You see their reactions are, are almost routines and the population is used to it and also obeys the rules very easily because they know the repercussions if they don't. Um, theoretically, we have gone through the exercise again and again and again. Reports have been published over the last years and many experts have warned that this would happen. And uh, many countries found themselves not as good prepared, as well prepared as they thought. And uh, therefore, I think the next crisis and I hope no one will, no, none will come, but uh, I think with certainty there will be more crisis. 
um, will, uh, will go better. And uh, there is a lot to learn out of the COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, why do I believe that the crisis will continue in different forms, in different shapes? And I'm thinking particularly about pandemics because global warming is increasing the possibility of the emergence of new viruses. Deforestation lets uh, humans live closer to animals and that increases the, uh, the chances of the leap. So we are creating the world which is in fact riskier and uh, this year by year. So one of the big hopes I have is that we not only talk about better preparation, but about an econ economic paradigm shift. And people discussing are discussing this. And it was not for me to surprise that the EU came out with uh, circular economy guidelines last week. Okay, that's exactly what I was going to ask you about um, next, because we touched a little bit about this in Davos, uh, in our design thinking uh, for business group, this kind of topic of circular economy has been rolling around, <laughs> to, <laughs> pun intended, for, for quite some time. Uh, but also, uh, you know, we said in Davos that like no one's really thought this through in a very sort of practical ways. It's not no one. There's been a bunch of people who have written books about it and maybe create some sort of manifestos and things like that and some interesting diagrams to look at. But one thing is looking at a diagram and another thing is shipping millions of tons of the same thing from around the globe and then not wasting it. So it feels like we're going to have to move from what one could describe in terms of circular economy from rubbish economy <laughs> to not a rubbish economy. How, what, what's your kind of top three bullet points of thoughts of moving from rubbish to non-rubbish economy? <laughs> yeah, there, there is, a, there is a movement in this area. <clears throat> As I said, um, there are discussions, but there are also concrete actions. So the World Economic Forum has rolled out a program and uh, working on this, um, now uh, intensively. On the other hand, I'm involved in circular businesses and uh, although we are in a crisis and also an economic crisis, um, we see very high demand there. So that shows me that companies are, are willing to accelerate their thinking and, and doing around it. Uh, the bottleneck is in fact the knowledge. I believe we don't have enough experts uh, knowledgeable about uh, what does it mean and how to create a circular economy, but um, humanity is known for its ability to learn fast, in particularly in crisis situation. I only hope that we don't forget the crisis that quickly. Um, yeah, it seems like the circular economy requirement ought to be a prerequisite in some sense towards making new products and services because more I kind of sit and contemplate around how many products are made in a way that are just supposed to be discarded at the end in God knows what way um, and, and, and how much opportunity there is to, well, basically redesign. A lot of products seem to be needing redesign in a sense of are, are these products even supposed to exist? in the world at all. And, uh, and if, we're, if we're redesigning it, it, it probably is going to be something quite radically different. Um, so so what, what are you seeing uh, kind of emerging uh, requirement, like immediate requirements from companies around supply chains? What do you think companies are going to start looking at as soon as the kind of uh, lockdown is, is, is sort of lifted? In terms of circular, circular production and consumption, I think that uh, companies are act, acting proactively here. So they are, 
they see pressures coming and uh, start thinking about how could they shift their products to a more sustainable uh, space. And the ingredients of the circular economy are, are around knowledge, which I mentioned, but also capital. So that means investors become more conscious about uh, impact investing, to direct it direct there. And there is regulation. And uh, the city, citizens might push for uh, harder and stricter regulation. So companies are uh, proactively looking into uh, how can they mitigate the risk that are coming with uh, these potential pressures. And, and so what, what's become very obvious is that so many businesses have gone bust like in a click of the fingers or they've, they've been completely crippled in their operations and, and therefore the, the idea of sustainable businesses, companies becomes a lot more proactively front of the mind, uh, not in a sense of, oh, sustainability is this thing where we're all green and we're hippies and we're looking after the environment. No, it's more like we want to remain in business even when there is a pandemic going on and uh, that that we can't just be so wasteful uh, in the way that we have been um, what what do you see happening in that respect especially considering that supply chains have been such talk of the like every single media has been talking about this is there a way to innovate sustainably with supply chain as the kind of starting point, as opposed to, oh, we'll work out how to do this after we've designed the products and services, but rather, here's the supply chain, here's what's really sustainably possible, and let's build and design things that, that, that go off the back of that somewhat. somewhat. Yeah, first, let me, let me give you my, my definition of supply chain. Uh, the supply chain is, in fact, or supply chain management is the management of processes from design to repurposing. So supply chain sits at the center of circular, circularity or non-circularity. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, that's that's my, my strong belief. And... Um, it starts all with the design of products. We need a new generation of designers that create products which can be decomposed easily and with materials that don't harm us and the planet. So it's, it's a, a question around the first, for me, step in supply chain management, which is design. And then it goes over to the uh, extraction, do that sustainable, then the production, how can we do sustainable production, which is, a, is largely electrified, and we have to avoid waste and wastewater and all these negative aspects. Then it's about the handling and distribution, which is around transport, and then it's about uh, the, whole, the whole utilization of the product and how do we get them back and repurposed and avoid that. In fact, 91% uh, of the raw material ends up in landfills or is burned or in the ocean. So it's in, it is about the different stages of supply chain and the supply chain design as, as a whole. Um, and that makes it that complex. And I'm also not a dreamer and, and think that we will reboot a different economy uh, compared to what we had before. We will reboot largely what we had before, but it depends what decisions in respect to the futures, to the future we are going to take. Uh, you asked me what the companies will do immediately differently and to um, ensure that they are more resilient to shocks. I believe that um, digitization and decentralization, flexible structures, uh, all these are the topics they will think about. 
were our systems good enough to send people home and let them work efficiently and without too, too much cyber risk? Could we have automated a bit more uh, where, we, where we were uh, vulnerable against the shock? Uh, could we have uh, had um, more flexible structures to downsize? I, I think um, the thinking will first be around resilience, agility, flexibility, decentralization, and how can uh, technology and new ways of doing business help to make us more robust? You know, as you were saying uh, things around, you know, the amount of production of effectively rubbish, which I <laughs> dubbed rubbish economy, uh, you know, it reminded me of going to Egypt uh, a few years ago and snorkeling around in, in um, Sharm el Sheikh. And as I was snorkeling, I kept on, you know, looking at jellyfish. And for every four or five jellyfish that I saw, there was a plastic bag that was also swimming along. And I kept on sort of, you know, taking these plastic bags out and putting them on the shore. You know, and the guy there was saying, like, don't worry about it. There's loads of them. You know, you'll never snorkel them all out. And I said, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to snorkel them all out, but I'm trying to do my little bit for the, for, for, for the world, really, and to clean up. But, you know, it's so good to hear that, you know, you see supply chain as coming from design first. Uh, how, who, which companies or which initiatives are supporting this scaling up of uh, 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 circular economy uh, designers. Basically, that's what I see. I saw somebody dub this as going from egocentric design to ecocentric design. So it's not even about designing systems, but designing ecosystems and with uh, you know ecosystem in mind. How how is this going to emerge? Yeah, I, I personally believe that it's coming through the startups, uh, through the next generation of, uh, of people, uh, next generation designers, next generation companies. And uh, this will then convert into cir circularity uh, from two, uh, in two ways. Either they grow big, or they will be incorporated and their knowledge, their teams, their technologies, their products, their processes into the uh, larger companies. And both, both is happening. We see a bigger ecosystem emerging around circularity and we see more focus from the or of the um, larger corporates on circularity. And then uh, I would like to just say it again. I believe that the capital markets and the investors play a very important role because they decide who gets the support, how to channel the money. So it, it, it's, it's fascinating because impact investing is something that I came across only like a few years ago, and it sounded a little bit... I wasn't really 100% sure what it meant. And now suddenly that becomes also like front of the mind, almost like unless you're doing impact investing, you, you're not really thinking clearly. How, how do you see that uh, then also just to follow on and what you just said? How, how, to what extent will venture capitalists and investors going to have to fit into this to even you know, make money going forward? The answer is very easy because you only have to look um, into the media and what are the, the news, the headlines from big banks, uh, major funds, and uh, it's, it's increasingly visible that uh, these people, the decision makers, they're have understood that there will be little support for uh, businesses that are not um, acting or saying that they will try to act sustainably. But the risk level 
um, increases and therefore uh, banks say they will not finance projects uh, um, which um, uh, promote fossil fuels uh, and, and we will see more industries um, being seen as less uh, worth, worthy to, to invest. I was uh, attended in a Swiss embassy in London a talk from um, chairman of, of BlackRock and seeing now that in US BlackRock is playing a key part in some of the um, financial aspects of paying out in investments around uh, sort of the bailout packages and so on. Uh, but, but the chairman said, like, we really have to invest into sustainable businesses it's no longer kind of a sexy thing to do and so on. It's a fiduciary duty to our clients to ensure that the businesses we're investing in will be there in one, two, three, four, five years time. Um, and um, so, so this seems to be now like 100% front of the mind and no longer just the sexy chit chat on the side. It's like front of the stage. Um, so, how, but but one thing that I've noticed as well, and looking at the bailout packages from UK and so on, it seems that the individual people, like self-employed, are being hard hit by the by the bailout packages, as well as then startups and small businesses seem to be almost like on the side of the of the consideration somewhat, uh, because everything is going through big banks and so on. So. The startup people, including myself, I just felt really, really pressurized by this whole situation. Yet, what you're saying is that it depends on startups and entrepreneurs and people who are able to effectively bootstrap uh, in many respects from the ground up to, to, to effectively redesign humanity, yeah? redesign the civilization. How is that all going to like, add up? If I knew, uh, <laughs> and, and as, as I said, it depends on the people who invest and also the people who bail out. And uh, I, I believe that um, startups should be supported. And I have a clear view where the money should go to. Um, and uh, if that's not the case, um, we will pay the bill at a certain point. Um, it's, it's, I think it's a, not a question of prediction, it's a question of responsibility. Are mm -hmm. the leaders mm -hmm. who, who make these critical decisions up to the challenge? There is clearly a need for saving jobs and uh, uh, ensuring social peace. And uh, that might be a short-term goal for, for some people. Um, I see also the risk that sustainability will uh, be um, sacrificed potentially in, in some areas on the altar of jobs. But at the end, our children need a place to live. And if we go, go on as we did before, um, this will be hard for them. So. I don't know how it will play out. And uh, as you, everybody tries to contribute her or his uh, bid to it. And um, I hope that we will succeed and uh, create over the next, the next years a planet which is, which is different, uh, more protected, an economy which is different and a planet which is more protected. I'm conscious of time. Just one more last question uh, before I let you go, because I know you're busy and all that stuff. So th there is a, a subject here that's also been cropping up more and more, which is around the supply of money and potential movement towards some sort of digital currencies, even potentially coming from central banks and who knows, maybe IMF and so on. Do you see a future in I don't know what period, time period, where at least some sort of maybe centralized, who knows what, uh, cryptocurrency 
or blockchain-based digital currency is issued out to people and then potentially used to be integrated to track supply chains because that might be used for knowing what people are buying and in what quantities so that it, the whole kind of circularity of it all can be tracked and projected and maintained and so on. Do, do you see that happening or not? And why? First, I see a future based on uh, virtual digital uh, currency. I see that future very, very clearly because all, all areas are going into a digital direction. And it's only logical that money will be digitized. That's, for me, very clear in my mind. I wouldn't link it to supply chains, though, because in supply chain, uh, digital currency um, has very different uh, purposes. It is, um, it can be used as an incentive, as a token, um, an incentive for certain behaviors which support the digital business model. But this is a very different discussion. So, so you, in, in, a, in a short answer, you don't see a digital currency being connected to uh, like potentially some sort of UBI solution where people are given universal basic income that, that, that's kind of assigned to being able to buy bread, milk, butter, basic supplies, uh, and that, that, that doesn't allow people to buy things that they essentially don't really need in the kind of uh, basic living situations. You don't see that happening. If that's the question, that's uh, one, one way of using digital currency because uh, it gives you much more room for play. You can think about this, you can think about a, uh, a digital currency for um, a storm in, uh, in the Caribbean area, you can think about a currency for the Nepal earthquake. Uh, yes, you can have very well targeted uh, currencies. So that's very much a possibility. And in that sense, that's where I see that currency uh, as, as, as part of kind of supply chain because it, it's enabling potentially, well, geographic areas as well as usage uh, purposes kind of to be incentivized or completely uh, you know, cut off, as in you take your digital wallet and you either you're buying bread and milk or you're not buying anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can, it, it allows steering in, in many ways, like uh, digital tools in, in general. Uh, I see this very well. You can use it for six months because it's linked to a uh, crisis. And if you can't use it, then your brother might use it or your neighbor. You, you might think about uh, those, those uh, mechanisms to have a much more uh, effective and, and fair world. Um, okay, yeah. And, and that really obviously depends then on who runs the whole currency thing and how it's designed. So we go back to the design of the system and how sustainable that is and, uh, and ecological friendly, including humans, not forgetting them, but not letting them go into some sort of egotistical trip where everyone wants to be, um, you know, uh, the king, basically, <laughs> to put it like that. Uh, Wolfgang, how, how are you going to spend the rest of your year? What's your core focus uh, to wrap up? I'm thinking a lot about the circular economy and uh, about the reboot, as I said. Um, and uh, I hope I will not spend too much on living with the consequences of the COVID-19 uh, outbreak and that this virus is seasonal and goes away quickly. Um, so my, my uh, intent is to go uh, back to business as usual and support the startups I'm involved in to help the corporates 
to deal with uh, digital business models and uh, you will probably see um, some writing about um, how to make the world more sustainable. Okay, and we'll, we'll link to your uh, website in the description of this video, but just tell the people where they can find more from your thinking, where they can read about uh, your thinking now. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay.